During our discussion of the rock cycle, we discussed the three different main types of rocks. So we talked about igneous rocks, we talked about metamorphic rocks, and we also talked about sedimentary rocks and that the process by which we make sediments, which we can then kind of uh, glue back together to make sedimentary rocks, the processes to make that sediment are called weathering and erosion. The, the breakdown of pre-existing rock, whether it is igneous, metamorphic, or already sedimentary rock, the breakdown of that rock actually um, can happen in a couple of different ways. It can happen through physical weathering or chemical weathering. And um, believe it or not, the sediment that is made through that processing of weathering and then the movement of that sediment through the process of erosion can actually create uh, a contaminant. Soil or sediment can actually be a contaminant. But believe it or not, soil can also be a resource, and it's actually very important um, to have that soil as a resource. Um, and you can imagine that that makes sense if you are an agricultural society. Um, but also, too, just to kind of, you know, keep soil from moving, right? You don't have tons of erosion and washout and flooding and whatever else. So we're going to talk today about how do we make sediments, the process of breaking down that rock into sediments. That's the weathering part. And then the, um, the movement or the removal of that sediment through the processes of erosion, which can be through wind, water, or ice. So first of all, the terminology that we're going to talk about today, we're going to be using the term sediments a lot. And sediments are just, you know, unconsolidated. And what I mean by that is loose, right? These are not glued together, not lithified. So loose fragments of rocks and minerals. So, you know, sand is a good example of a sediment. Uh, when that sediment becomes glued back together, right, when it becomes lithified, that's when it becomes a sedimentary rock. So you can imagine that if this is the sediment over here on the left, once you actually have pressure and compaction and squeezing and then a little bit of uh, cementation by fluids, it can become a sedimentary rock. So um, the sediments that we're going to talk about today, though, are this kind of stuff over here, this loose stuff, the unlithified uh, still movable, still pliable fragments of rock and mineral that have been broken down by the processes of uh, weathering. So recently exposed rock is what we call fresh rock. So a good example of fresh rock would be the, you know, when you go down 321 through Blowing Rock and you're heading down towards um, Hickory and Lenore and they've just blasted a section of 321 with um, dynamite or whatever else. So that's recently exposed rock, right? The mineral grains have their original shape and their original composition, and they have not had significant time to react with any sort of natural elements, right? So they haven't had time to react with like oxygen in the air or water in the atmosphere, things like that. The fresh rock is the kind of, you know, unaltered um, exposed new stuff. Um, after that stuff sits out, though, for several years, maybe decades or more, that fresh rock starts to break down. It reacts with air. It reacts with the oxygen in the air. It reacts with the humidity, the water in precipitation, um, and even organisms, right, like lichens and, and, uh, and uh, moss and things like that, can actually start to degrade the rock, and we call that then weathered rock. Um, the weathered rock is what's actually what we're going to talk about today because the weathering process kind of weakens or breaks up the fresh or solid rock. And remember, that's what we want, right? We want to break it up. We want to make it into sediment. And so um, the, the process of um, chemically breaking it down, right, through oxygen or water uh, or physically breaking it down, like actually, you know, heaving it apart with frost or organisms, that's going to start to break our rock, our fresh rock, into weathered um, pieces, and those are what we want for sediment. There are two main types of weathering, and, I, and I'm pretty sure you learned these in like sixth grade earth science, right? So there's physical weathering, which uh, you may also call mechanical weathering. Either one is fine. Uh, mechanical weathering breaks the rocks into smaller and smaller pieces by some sort of physical or mechanical means. So literally, you know, you can think of an example of mechanical weathering is dropping a plate, right? The plate breaks and shatters into several pieces. That's a physical force, right? That's just the force of gravity pulling that plate down and it shatters on the floor. So you can mechanically break rock into smaller and smaller pieces. 
or you can chemically break rock. And the difference between mechanical and chemical weathering is that chemical weathering is going to break the bonds at the atomic level. So you're literally going to have um, bonds between atoms, either breaking, stretching, changing, something like that, so that the rock actually has some sort of a deterioration, right? It's going to break down by a chemical reaction. And the big agents of this are going to be oxygen and water are going to be the two biggest agents for our um, chemical weathering reactions. So let's look at this. Let's look at physical weathering reactions first. Physical weathering is going to break down rock into smaller and smaller pieces. Now, chemical weathering also breaks rock into smaller and smaller pieces. But remember that physical weathering does it by some sort of mechanical force. As these weathering processes break rock into smaller and smaller pieces, those pieces are actually categorized by size. So you have probably heard the term before, gravel, or you've heard someone say pebbles or you know sand, but those categories actually relate to diameters of grain sizes. So a sediment that has an average grain size we'll use pebbles here first, that has an average grain diameter between 4 and 64 millimeters, those would be called pebbles. Um, the next size smaller, if you have an average grain diameter of 2 to 4 millimeters, we would call those granules. When you get a little bit smaller, you get into sand. So all of these actually down here from here to here, oops, all of those are sand, but you can have coarse, medium, or fine sand. And then when you get even smaller below sand, you get these two. And so finer grain than sand is silt and then clay. Silt actually still feels gritty. And uh, if you kind of rub it between your fingers, clay will feel really smooth, right? It'll almost feel like, um, like Play-Doh or something like that. Um, silt will feel more gritty, right? A little bit like, um, I don't know, like a, like a toothpaste or kind of a, something like that. But um, all of these names, right? Pebbles, granules, sand, silt, and clay, those are names that are responsible for uh, describing size categories of sediment. So now when you say granules or when you say pebbles, those actually are denoting an actual grain diameter. Notice too that up here, the term gravel is actually used for anything that's greater than two millimeters. So you know, gravel is anything bigger than say something you would put in your fish tank. And um, before we start to uh, break down our rocks by physical or chemical means, uh, we can kind of talk about which rocks are more susceptible to being broken down. So which rocks are going to, I guess, be weaker or which, which forces are going to help the uh, processes of breaking down rocks. So if you have rocks that have natural zones of weakness in them, uh, a good example of this is already pre-existing sedimentary rocks, right? Flat-lying sedimentary rocks usually have contacts between individual beds. This is bed one, this is bed two, and this might be, you know, a shale, and this may be a different rock type. Maybe that's a sandstone. And the boundary between those two, right, this here is called a bedding plane. Well, that's a zone of weakness, and so that can actually help rocks break apart. Organisms can actually really help break apart rock and believe it or not plants are actually much more destructive than other organisms. Plant roots can really get into rock and when they find small cracks they'll get into those small cracks and as the roots start to grow bigger they'll actually start to force the cracks open. Frost can do this as well. Frost will get into cracks and uh, excuse me water will get into cracks and when it freezes uh, it will expand when it turns to ice, and that will actually heave rocks and cracks open. It will make those cracks larger. You can also have minerals crystallizing inside, inside cracks in rocks, and so as the mineral crystals get bigger, uh, they force the rock open. Uh, we'll talk in a minute about this process of how heating and cooling, right? You know that a lot of times when, when things get warm, they expand. And when they cool, they kind of shrink a little bit. Well, imagine rocks sitting in a desert and every day they expand in the sun and they shrink at night. That can cause breakage in the rock. You lastly also can have um, an energy source, right? Any, any sort of um, 
uh, mechanism of exerting energy on the rock, whether it be moving water, moving ice, moving wind, whatever else, can then actually work to break down the rock as well. So let's look at a couple of examples of each of these and see how rocks are broken down. Here's a good example of physical weathering. Okay, so I'm gonna put down here physical. Physical weathering, because we are using water, okay? We're gonna use water, but we're not using a chemical reaction of water. We're actually just gonna take that water and the water is going to get into a crack during you know, warm weather, during either the warm day or the, the warm season. And then when temperatures get colder, the water will freeze. Now, when water freezes and turns to ice, it expands. Okay, so you can imagine that when the water that's sitting in this crack here freezes to ice and expands, it wants to push out in all directions. And so it will break the rock open in a process called wedging. So this is kind of the diagram, right? This is what's showing what's happening. And here's a real world example of what this would look like. So here's a rock with a couple cracks through it. And this was a crack at one point over here too, but water got into it and the water expanded and so this piece actually broke away and is now leaning. That's because this has now been wedged apart. And we call that wedging frost wedging, okay? Because the freeze thaw process of the water lets the water get in there when it's liquid and then when it expands, it actually wedges or breaks the rock apart. So this is a physical process because it's kind of mechanically doing it. You're not having the water react by any sort of chemical means. Here's other types of wedging. So that first one that we saw was frost wedging, right? Here's examples over here of root wedging. This is where roots actually get into the cracks in the rock. You can see the roots are actually growing into the cracks of the rock here. And as those roots get bigger, right, these cracks are gonna start to kind of get wedged open larger and larger. So this is called root wedging. And over here, this one's called salt wedging. This is because in coastal regions, right, any sort of, um, uh, wind or air coming off of the ocean is going to have water vapor in it and that water vapor will have a lot of salt, right? Halite dissolved in it. Well, when that salt um, kind of gets into the cracks and this is just an example, this is a coastal gravestone in England. When the salt gets into the cracks in some of the gravestones here, the salt crystals start to crystallize and as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, they will push the rock open as the crystals grow. So this is uh, salt wedging, right? The growth of the salt crystals is mechanically forcing the rock apart. Um, here's another example of physical weathering. This is called uh, and this is called um, insulation. And notice that I'm not I'm spelling it in sol s o l. Remember that s o l means sun in Spanish, right? So insolation means um, heat. So heat causes expansion. And that's supposed to be an a. Uh, and then at night, right, the rocks cool down and they uh, they contract a bit, right? So this kind of insulation means the heating and expansion and that's the process right so this is the process and this is the reaction so it creates a weathering reaction called spalling spalling is what you're seeing on the picture on the left here this is where the rock almost kind of looks like it's flaking off this is a physical or mechanical weathering process because every day this rock sits in the hot sun it expands a little bit in you know 100 degree weather and then it contracts a little bit at night when it gets cool, but every day it does this expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. And so the outer edge of the rock starts to kind of flake apart, and this is called spalling. You may have actually seen this around campus. We see this every once in a while with uh, concrete. In fact, my driveway is currently doing this. Um, this is also uh, this kind of flaking off or sheeting off of concrete is called spalling. It could be due to insulation. Um, the drive, my driveway is actually doing it because of salt, but um, yes, you can also see it on campus because of insulation, that kind of con um, expansion and contraction every day due to temperature change. So here's another, the process that we're gonna talk about, this is called stress release, and the reactions that we're gonna create are called jointing and exfoliation. So remember, all these slides are showing you process here, 
and then this over here is going to be here's the the uh, reaction what do the rocks do so uh, little stick dinosaur for scale <laughs> this is supposed to show that at some point in time right this rock was definitely deep down in the earth right and it was feeling lots and lots of pressure from all the rock around it and then at some other time we eroded off all the rock on top of it right little dinosaur goes away now you have stick person geologist for scale but that that rock is now at the earth's surface all the rock that was once above it has now been uh, removed and so this rock now feels a lot less pressure and so that pressure release or that stress release can cause the rock to break apart so the decompression that we create by releasing the stress creates cracks and the cracks are called joints or exfoliation and i'll show you why the cracks are called different things it has to do with how they are oriented these are joints okay so this is look at there's a little geology hammer for scale here in the middle so that's you know about you know 12 or 16 inches long right there and you'll notice that this outcrop is showing a lot of cracks okay you see all these crack sets coming through here right and then there's a couple going this way a couple going this way all these cracks here are called joints joints are formed by decompression or stress release but joints tend to just be kind of cracks that are at right angles to each other like this okay so jointing is where rocks crack apart and they don't really move much they just pop open they just crack open and so joints form when the cracks have kind of right angles to each other like this picture here or you can get something called exfoliation and notice that now here's the cracks right all the cracks are running this way which means that actually there's a plane of cracking that's kind of going up under each of these little sheets like this right so all the cracks that are forming are parallel parallel to a sloping surface right this is called exfoliation exfoliation happens a lot in um, metamorphic rocks okay metamorphic rocks tend to to break up by exfoliation and that means that they tend to have these kind of cracks that form parallel to a sloping surface usually this is pretty dangerous right because every time you crack off a piece of rock it can then slide down the slope and we'll talk about that on monday when we deal with um landslides and mass wasting but so exfoliation just means that the cracks are now oriented parallel to a sloping surface and remember these form usually in metamorphic rocks what we just saw on the previous slide jointing that usually happens in more resistant rock types like igneous rocks or sedimentary rocks uh, if you want to see a really cool video check out this link down here um, a couple of hikers were um, filming as they were moving around a slope that actually looks really similar to the one in this picture but they actually caught on camera um, exfoliation happening and um, it doesn't look very exciting in the beginning so give it a couple of, of seconds before the video really gets going and it'll actually stabilize but you'll see the entire surface of the slope start to lift and then huge cracks start to form and the whole surface kind of releases its stress and you can actually see that on the video so pretty cool stuff and it's neat when we can catch geology happening uh, on film okay so those were some great examples of physical weathering and now let's go over examples of chemical weathering i'm going to give you i think four different types so the first one that we want to talk about is this reaction of dissolution um, if you put sugar in your coffee or if you put salt on your food you are actively using the process of dissolution um, now I'm going to show you two I'm going to show you the process so dissolution is the chemical weathering process and I'm going to break it down I'm going to kind of show you how the process breaks rock into smaller and smaller pieces chemically um, so in this example here the equation is taking a solid mineral you could pick whatever you want with let's try let's do salt right you could add then uh, either an acid or just plain water and so in this example we're going to add just plain water and what happens is is that if you look at this picture down here imagine that these are all salt crystals right this is sodium this is chlorine oops the orange is chlorine and so if that is a salt crystal these are just water molecules right this is h2o molecules and the polarity of the h2o molecules is strong enough to just break the weak ionic bonds between neighboring sodium and chlorine atoms 
And if you remember from our discussion of minerals, ionic bonds are pretty weak, right? So what happens is, is that the water molecules can actually break the bonds between the sodium atoms and the chlorine atoms, and then you get ions in solution. So now these are dissolved ions here in the water solution. So the salt bonds, the, the, the ionic bonds and the salt get broken by the water. So this is a, an example of dissolution. Sugar dissolves in your coffee the same way, right? And so you end up with essentially ions in solution where you once had a solid and a liquid. If you've ever been caving, right? If you've ever gone into um, a cave like Carlsbad Caverns or Worley's Cave or anything like that over in Tennessee, um, the holes, those caves, holes in limestone are a result of the same process, right? Dissolution. The process is a little different because instead of using salt or sugar, this CaCO3, right? This is the mineral calcite and that's what limestone is made out of. And so this picture on the left, all this stuff in here, right? This is limestone. And instead of just adding water, we have this. This is H2CO3 and we call that carbonic acid. How does water become acidic? Well, if you have water in the atmosphere and you have CO2 in the atmosphere, that can combine together to make H2CO3, which is carbonic acid, and you know that as acid rain. So acid rain plus the calcite in limestone will actually lead to the dissolution of the limestone and the dissolved ions that you have then are calcium ion and carbonate ions or bicarbonate ions depending. Okay, so that was the first one, that was dissolution. This is now the second chemical weathering process. This is the process of hydration. Let's think about this in simplest terms, right? What do you do when you hydrate? Okay, you go to the gym, you exercise, and what do they say? It's always very important to hydrate. What do you do when you hydrate? You simply drink water, right? You simply add water. So this process of hydration is exactly what you would do when you go to the gym, right? You have a solid mineral and you add water. And the reason I'm making this point is because the next um, weathering process that I wanna show you, show you sounds very similar to hydration and it also uses water, but it doesn't just add the water, it actually uses the water to make a chemical reaction. So hydration is very simply just add or remove, okay, add or remove water. And then what you get is either a new hydrated mineral or a dehydrated mineral if you're actually removing the water. So you can actually have, here's gypsum. Remember, gypsum is a mineral that you saw last week in lab. And it is a hydrated calcium sulfate. And when you take the water away, when you dehydrate gypsum, you get calcium sulfate without the water, and that is a mineral called anhydrite. If you add water, Right, here's a mineral that you also saw in lab, here's hematite. And if you simply just add water to that by the process of hydration, you can create now a hydrated iron oxide, and that's a new mineral that we call limonite. So the process of hydration, remember, very simply, we're just adding or removing water to the mineral to make it something new. Okay. This word looks really similar to the one we just did, right? But this one's a different one. This is our third process. This is called hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is where you actually take a hydrogen ion, okay? So you're gonna take an H plus ion, and it's usually from either water or acid, and you're going to react that with a mineral. Now, specifically, we want it to react with minerals that have what we call mobile cations. Do you remember what a cation is? Okay, a cation is a positively charged ion. Remember we said that the T in cation stands for the plus? So a cation is a positively charged ion, and we want minerals that have mobile cations, ones that are easily replaced. And what are we gonna replace it by? The H plus from the water or an acid. So let's look at a great example of this. This is probably one of the, um, one of the most important weathering reactions in all of geology. You guys saw in lab, you saw feldspar, right? So here is the uh, chemical equation for feldspar. This is potassium, aluminum, and it is a silicate. So potassium, aluminum, silicate. Now, potassium happens to be one of these mobile cations. 
So when feldspar is reacted with a source of H plus ions, and so remember, we can make an acid very easily in everyday water just by mixing water and CO2. So if we have H plus, that H plus will react with the feldspar. And remember, what we're looking for is for the H plus to replace the mobile cation. So this is supposed to be my arrow, right, showing the equation. If we go now and look at the mineral that it forms, it forms a mineral called kaolinite. Notice that kaolinite is an aluminum silicate. What's missing? Well, remember we said that the potassium was a mobile cation? So the potassium now becomes a dissolved ion. We've actually kind of sheared it off. We've taken it off the feldspar. We've left behind the aluminum silicate we call that a new mineral called kaolinite, and the potassium goes out into solution, and so does some of the silica that used to be part of the feldspar. So in this process, feldspars, minerals that are often found in igneous rocks, break down into kaolinite, and kaolinite is a really important clay mineral that actually helps to form things like soils. So very important reaction by which feldspars break down into clay minerals. This is the process of hydrolysis. Here's just another example down here. So let me just show you quickly. These are two different examples, these equations here. So the one at the bottom is also showing that you can have the mineral olivine, which you saw in lab. It can react with H plus ions. And what it does then is the magnesium actually gets cleaved off the front and the hydrogen now replaces it with the silica, okay? So different from hydration, because we're not just adding water, we're using the H plus in the water to actually replace cations in the original mineral. And of course, this breaks the mineral down into something, uh, something different, right? So this is our feldspars breaking down into clays. Okay, last but not least, we have the process of oxidation and reduction. And my guess is you probably talked about oxidation and reduction um, possibly in chemistry class, maybe even in physics class. And this is just a reaction where some element within your uh, mineral either gains or loses an electron or several electrons. So how do we remember this? Okay, the way that I remember this is to say that, okay, E minus is an electron. Okay, that's my shorthand for electrons. Electrons have negative charge, okay? If you add electrons, if you get more and more negative charges, your charge should get reduced, right? If you add negative numbers, right, your charge should go down. And so the process of reduction is where you are gaining electrons. So that's how I always remember it, right, is that the reduction is the process of gaining negative charge, so gaining electrons. The opposite of that is oxidation. So oxidation is when you lose electrons and you become more positively charged. This is a very, um, very I should, ubiquitous, I guess, happens everywhere, um, chemical weathering reaction, because the best agent for oxidation is atmospheric oxygen. So oxygen in the atmosphere or oxygen in water is um, a big culprit of this oxidation reaction. You see oxidation reduction every time you see a metal rusting, okay? So that's a perfect example of how we see oxidation happening in everyday life. If we have, um, for example, here, here is a mineral called pyroxene, and um, pyroxene actually is an iron silicate, but the iron is two plus here, right? So two plus iron, it's a cation, but it is in the reduced form. So reduced iron is what we call ferrous iron. Reduced iron is usually kind of, you know, greenish in color or um, kind of greenish gray. When ferrous iron reacts with oxygen, you'll notice now that over here, our iron is now what we call ferric iron. Our ferric cation, our ferric iron cation is now a three plus, okay? We have now a three plus charge. We had a two plus charge before, we now have a three plus charge to our iron. Does that mean we have gained or lost an electron? If our charge went up, got more positive, that means we have lost 
an electron. And that is the process of, I should do it in red, oxidation. So the rusting that you see, right, here's a train car rusting, that is an oxidation reaction because the oxygen is now causing the iron to lose an electron. And uh, we change from ferrous or reduced iron to ferric iron, which is the oxidized form. Okay, so ferric iron is red, ferrous iron is kind of greenish. Now, we've gone through a couple of different reactions, right? Chemical and physical weathering reactions. And they don't just occur on their own, right? They actually do work together. So um, physical weathering can help to speed up chemical weathering. Let's talk about why this is the case. If physical weathering is gonna break up a rock, what it actually does is it makes more surface area for chemicals to start to deteriorate the rock. Okay, what do I mean by that? Let's look at a block of rock, okay? It's not often that we get a perfect cube, but notice that in this block of rock, you have a cube that has essentially six sides, right? And so the surface area of this cube of rock is about six square meters. Okay, so let's assume that that's the case. What that means now is that uh, chemicals have six different sides to work on. I can't draw the other th three, but you understand what I'm saying. Okay, it has edges that it can work on. It has corners that it can work on. Good, stuff like that. But now let's break this cube. Let's break this cube into eight smaller cubes. Now, all eight of these cubes each have six sides and we've increased the surface area to now being 12 square meters. All the stuff that was once in the middle, right, and it was all protected in here when we had one cube is now open and exposed and chemicals can now get in and start to break the rock from the inside. Let's beat a dead horse, right, and go ahead and break that cube down into smaller and smaller cubes. Now, if we break each of these cubes down into a lot more cubes, notice that now the surface area has gone up even more. Now you have 60 square meters of surface area. So the more surface area you have, right, the more cracks, the more surface area. And that means that the chemicals can now infiltrate in all these different little cracks and start to now deteriorate the rock. So physical weathering speeds up chemical weathering because the physical weathering breaks the rock into smaller and smaller pieces, increasing the surface area for chemicals to work on. Now, chemical weathering also speeds up physical weathering. If you have, this is a granite, right? We're showing a granite block right here. And so it's got the minerals in it, quartz, biotite, and feldspar. Quartz is very stable, right? So it's not going to react. But we know that feldspar chemically weathers by the process of hydrolysis, right? And actually, so does biotite. So the feldspar minerals, the pink ones, and the biotite minerals, these kind of brownish colored ones, they will start to break down by chemical weathering reactions, namely by hydrolysis. As those minerals start to break down, the rock actually weakens and it's much easier to break it apart physically. You could imagine that if you had a block of, of unweathered granite, right, and you tried to squeeze it, it would be really, really hard to squeeze it, right? But if you had a piece of granite that had been uh, you know, significantly weathered, the feldspars had started to break down into clays, the biotites had started to break down, you could actually now squeeze that rock in your hand and you could start to powder some of it. So the, the way of physically breaking it would become easier because it had been weakened by chemical weathering reactions. Now, the role of CO2 is super important to the process of weathering. And I'm gonna show you kind of a step-by-step -step way uh, about how we can categorize this. Generally speaking, weathering in nature is a very slow process. If you took 1101, you remember that you took a little bottle of acid, right? And you kind of put one little drop of acid on a piece of calcite and that calcite fizzed like crazy, right? 
Well, that's we're using a pretty concentrated acid with respect to what you see in nature. It's a weak acid generally, but with respect to what you see in nature, um, you know, chemical weathering reactions are pretty slow. We speed them up in the lab, but generally speaking, right, we actually saw that picture that showed 100 years worth of weathering, right? It was a really, really slow process. So weathering is a slow process, and how can we speed it up? Well, we can speed it up by making more and more acid. One of the easiest ways in nature to make acid is this process of making carbonic acid by using rainwater and CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, so H2CO3 is carbonic acid, and so that's what makes acid rain. And so the more we can make carbonic acid, the more we can help speed up chemical weathering. So the more we put CO2 into the atmosphere, right, the more CO2 values in the atmosphere go up, the more acid we can make. And then, of course, that means we can really start to speed up chemical weathering. So remember, chemical weathering can break apart carbonate rocks, right? That's the calcite that's in things like limestones. But it can also break down um, uh, rocks by the process of hydrolysis. So several different weathering reactions, dissolution and hydrolysis, uh, use the um, acids that we're going to make by mixing CO2 and water. And it actually creates a cycle of weathering and how that weathering reacts to climate. So you remember we talked about earth systems, right? So we talked about earth systems up here. Um, and we talked a lot about the geodynamo system and plate tectonics. Now, if we think about what's going on in this uppermost climate system, we can see how weathering is affected by climate and vice versa. Now, we just made the link, right, that um, CO2 in the atmosphere, okay, CO2 in the atmosphere can actually now add to increased chemical weathering because CO2 plus H2O makes acid. What else does an increase in CO2 do to the atmosphere? What do you see happening all over the planet right now? Okay, an increase in CO2 in the atmosphere also leads to climate warming. Now think about it, when you're in chemistry class, what are two things you can do to make your chemical reactions go faster? One, you can add heat, right? A lot of times you put it on a hot plate, and two, you add a catalyst, right? You add something to make it go faster. It's supposed to be a Y. So in nature, we can actually do this whole thing of adding heat and adding a catalyst. And the, the important player here is CO2. If we add CO2 to water, we make an acid. That's our catalyst. But adding CO2 to the atmosphere also causes global warming. So we've also added heat. So the addition of CO2 not only makes acid, but it also makes heat, right, a warmer atmosphere. And so that acid and that heat actually now increases chemical weathering. The process of chemical weathering, though, here, let me write this down. Chemical weathering uses... CO2. So it removes, okay, reduces CO2 in the atmosphere. So what actually happens is now weathering is speeded up, speeded up, sped up, gets faster. Cool. I haven't had coffee yet. So weathering gets faster here. And so the increase in chemical weathering rates means that now you're going to be pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere at a faster and faster rate. So what happens to global temperature when you remove CO2 from the atmosphere? When you remove CO2 from the atmosphere, you get climate cooling. When temperatures are now cold and we have low values of CO2, that means the rate of chemical weathering slows down. So now we have a reduced chemical weathering rate. Because we have a slow weathering rate, that means that over time, natural processes can start to slowly build up CO2 back into the atmosphere again through either volcanoes or carbonates or something like that. 
So CO2 will eventually build back up into the atmosphere. And remember that when we build back CO2 into the atmosphere, that leads to climate warming and speeds up weathering. But then that weathering reduces CO2, goes to cooling, and you actually have this entire cycle here. So climate and weathering kind of play into each other all throughout Earth history. There have been plenty of times where you have global warming, right? That warming speeds up chemical weathering. That chemical weathering then pulls CO2 out of the atmosphere, which leads to global cooling. So it's really important that you understand this kind of cycle of CO2 and climate. So make sure that you understand how to uh, explain this. I'm pretty sure this is going to be coming soon to a quiz or an exam near you. So hint, hint, make sure you understand this. And if you don't, uh, make sure you send me an email and we can talk about it. Okay, so not all minerals are going to react either physically or chemically. Remember that some of the most stable minerals, right, things like quartz or things like hematite, these are the most stable minerals, which means that they have an extremely slow rate of weathering. Lots of other minerals, though, are unstable, right, which means that they are going to have a very fast rate of weathering. So here's salt. There's that calcite mineral, which makes limestones here. Notice there's feldspars and pyroxenes. There's another type of feldspar. These are all the, the minerals that we showed in our example of uh, things like um, dissolution or hydrolysis. So things like quartz, right, very stable. That's why lots of beach sands are made of almost nothing but quartz. And other minerals that tend to react are going to be things like halite, calcite, and olivine, and they are going to be very unstable, right? We don't often see beaches made of calcite or halite because they tend to break down by chemical means very quickly. There are certain things that will affect how a rock is going to weather. So, um, you know, this is kind of the predisposition of a rock to whether it will break down by physical or chemical means. Um, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, right, that there can be certain properties of the rock. For example, if a rock has like a zone of weakness, right, like uh, bedding planes or if the rock has minerals that are soluble in it, it's going to break down faster. So properties of the parent rock. OK, so whatever the rock is that you're weathering, there are certain properties that the the excuse me, the parent rock can have that will cause it to weather faster. For example, if it's bedded, if it has, you know, zones of weakness, or if it has soluble minerals in it, it's going to break down a lot faster. The presence of soil is also important because you can imagine if you have rock, right, here's my rock here, and then on top of that, you've got a thin package of soil. Soil is going to kind of hold all sorts of things like water and gases right up against that rock. And so soil is actually going to hold water and gases that will help to kind of now start to break down and crack the rock underneath it. So the presence of soil will hold water and will certainly help chemical and potentially physical weathering. Rock that is particularly old, right, rock that has had a long time of exposure is going to have more time to break down both chemically and physically. So the longer a rock is exposed to atmospheric oxygen, atmospheric rainfall, whatever else, the more time it has to weather. So old rock definitely is going to be more weathered than young rock. And lastly, on the next slide, we're going to elaborate on this, that climate is going to be really important because remember, climate is going to essentially be our catalyst. It's going to be the way that we can speed up weathering reactions by increasing temperature and abundant rainfall is going to help make those acids that we will need for many of our chemical weathering reactions. So if you look at a graph like this, this should make a whole lot of sense based on what we just talked about in terms of climate. Let me orient you really quickly. On the axis here on the left side, okay, we're talking about temperature. So we're hot down here and we're cold up here. Now on the uh, x-axis along the bottom here, you're talking about rainfall. So you're wet over here and your dry conditions are over here, okay? So this graph is actually showing you where you would, in terms of climate, most likely get um, chemical weathering reactions versus mechanical weathering reactions. 
important thing to remember is that over here, and it doesn't show it very well on this one, but over here, right, these conditions don't exist in nature. So we're going to kind of cross this stuff out over here and say you don't really have conditions that are very cold and very wet. We just don't have that in nature. So don't worry so much about this left side of the diagram here. Let's look at it a little bit more as we go in. What are the trends that you notice? Well, where you have cold temperatures here and relatively dry, arid conditions, notice that you get mostly mechanical weathering. So this field up here is mechanical weathering. Ooh. However, down here where you have warm temperatures and you have relatively high rainfall, remember, right, temperature and rainfall are going to be our catalysts for many of our chemical weathering reactions. Notice that down here you get chemical weathering reactions. So this can kind of predict which would you most likely see in, say, a dry, hot desert, right? Well, in a dry desert where temperatures are hot and dry, you might have very little weathering, or you might have, if there's a little bit of cooler temperatures, especially at night, you might work your way up into the mechanical weathering range. If you are in the tropics and you have hot temperatures with very wet conditions, you're more likely going to get chemical weathering reactions. So lots of weathering reactions in the tropics, not so much in the kind of colder and drier climates. The weathering that we're talking about, the physical and chemical weathering that happens between say, you know, atmospheric, ooh, that's the wrong color, atmospheric things like water and oxygen, they tend to react with rock and the boundary between uh, fresh rock, right, I'll say fresh rock down here, and the altered rock that's going to form by the reaction with water and oxygen is going to slowly over time move down into the rock. So imagine that you have now kind of this boundary between the fresh rock below and the altered or weathered rock above, and the boundary between those two is called the weathering front. The weathering front actually is what's going to then create, right, oops, I shouldn't put that there, sorry. It's gonna create soil, but the soil is gonna be the stuff that's on top of the weathering front, and it's actually then gonna be the fresh rock that's beneath it. So the weathering front is really important, and we remember that the weathering reactions will continue to happen wherever you have gases and water continuously present. So the gases and water are gonna be up here, right above the weathering front, and they're gonna to continue to create weathering reactions that push that weathering front further and further down into the fresh rock. So I'm trying to show that in this diagram over here, right? This would be your weathering front right here. This is gonna be down here, right, your parent rock. This is gonna be a nice igneous rock down here. The pluses tell me that this is an igneous rock. And then this whole thing on top, this would be a huge package of soil that is forming on top. And the weathering front would be the boundary between the actual rock and then the deteriorated rock that we call soil. The, it's really important to remember the effects of weathering. And I always think about this when I say, you know, okay, think about if you had a child and you wanted to build a new school for your children, right? Um, this would be something, the, the weathering of the rock beneath your site for where you're going to build that school would be incredibly important, right? Because you would have to remember that as you weather rock, the strength of the rock decreases. Okay, so the rock gets weaker, its density decreases, right? So it actually gets less dense. The amount of holes in the rock increases, right? So its porosity increases. This also makes the rock weaker. And in those holes, you can either have air or water. This can also weaken the rock. So you can think of this too, I, you know, we, we use the term, you know, thinking about the idea of where do I want to build a school for my kids? You can think about where do I want to build a house? The state of the weathered rock beneath your building is extremely important. So if nothing more, if you all want to be homeowners someday, 
it will be really important to know what is the state of the bedrock underneath your new home and is it relatively strong or will you have problems with you know weakness or landsliding or movement um, because of the weathered state of the rock underneath it. Okay, so for the second half of today's discussion, I want to talk about what happens when sediment, just, you know, raw, broken down um, rock material, rock grit, what happens to make that stuff what we would consider soil? Because sediment and soil are actually quite different. So technically, the definition of soil is sediment that has undergone changes at the Earth's surface, specifically so that it can support plant life. So generally speaking, sand is sediment, but it is not what we would consider soil because just raw sand can't technically um, support plant life. So, you know, let's think about the processes <clears throat> that change just kind of raw, broken up um, material, so sediment, into soil. It is important to study soils not only because of, you know, the basic um, kind of uh, intuitive things, right, for agriculture, for, for um, being able to support crops, being able to, you know, feed, the, feed your family or feed the country or whatever else. So agriculture, of course, is important, but it is also important, too, for other types, things like building planning, right? If you have soils that have certain types of properties, for example, if they are made from clays that when you add water, they expand, you know, 25 times their normal volume. That's a really important consideration for using a site for uh, for building property. Um, it's also important to know about soils in terms of waste disposal. Uh, certain soils have the ability to transmit water very well and others don't. But those that transmit water very well will also transmit contaminants really well. So important to know the properties of your soil in terms of things like waste disposal, contaminants, whatever else. Um, certainly important too to know whether you have a really thick package of soil and whether it is prone to um, what we call mass wasting. Mass wasting is a kind of a fancy term for um, you know all types of landslides and mud flows and debris flows and rock falls and all things like that. So sometimes if your um, soil in the subsurface is unstable, it is prone to mass wasting, and of course that's super important for any sort of building planning or whatever else. Um, Part of my research, what I find really interesting about soils is that you actually can use them to figure out what climate was like in the past. So you can actually use it to infer past climates. And so we can actually say, oh, this area used to be under a tropical climate because we see that, you know, 20,000 years ago, there happened to be tropical soils called laterites forming in this region. So interesting stuff, of course, about soils. Um, but let's talk about how we make soils. There are three main processes that help make sediment, just raw, broken up rock material into soil. And the first one, and I've keyed them to the diagram here, this first one here is that biology are gonna kind of use up nutrients in the, in the sediment and leave behind waste. So certain uh, organisms, and I mean plants as well as critters, right? They're going to use up, so the roots are gonna kind of take minerals and dissolve those minerals out of the uppermost part of the sediment and they will leave behind waste. So right, the tree is gonna drop leaves um, and actually add different types of nutrients back into the soil as part of its waste procedure. The second, large, uh, the second important process is percolation by water. Um, percolation is just a fancy term for moving not in a straight line. So uh, as rainwater, right, is kind of raining down onto the soil surface here, the water is eventually going to kind of slowly start to work its way down into the soil this way. And it doesn't move in a straight line, so we call it percolation of water or by water. Because all of the rainwater is moving from the top of the, the soil profile downwards, it's actually going to move a lot of the material down as well into the soil as the water infiltrates. Now, the last thing that's going to happen is we're going to have part three here. This is something called bioturbation. So bio means organisms, right? And turbid means mixing. So this is churning or mixing of the soil by whether it be roots or could be little worms or burrows of critters or something like that. But these three processes work together in order to turn straight sediment into soil. 
and a lot of it has to do with this kind of changing the nutrient balance moving the nutrients around by water and then also kind of mixing the soil layers by bioturbation because of this because of the movement for example right because of the movement of all the water right coming through here what tends to happen is that material that used to be right nutrients that used to be in the uppermost part of the soil up here tend to get washed down further into the bottom part of the soil this way right they get moved down so that the uppermost part of the soil becomes a zone of leaching now leaching here just means for us right it's a zone of loss what it means is that nutrients that used to be up in here right nutrients that used to be in that top part get washed down and they then accumulate deeper down in the soil so that then you set up kind of a boundary where you've got the upper part of the soil is a zone of leaching a zone of loss and the lower part of the soil is the zone of accumulation we're trying to show this in the diagram over here the little pluses right the little plus marks that you're seeing kind of moving their way down this way those are supposed to represent dissolvable ions and so those are ions being washed away from the top part of the soil and moved down into the bottom part and then the other little things that you're seeing here these little white dashes i think these little white dashes are supposed to mean like uh, clay or something like that so it's the physical movement of stuff and so those clay particles that used to be up here are now being moved down into the bottom part so your lower part of your soil is your zone of accumulation now remember too that soils are going to kind of set up these zones and they're going to kind of have a flat layered boundary like this so soils are going to end up at the end of all these processes with horizontal layers those layers okay the soils are going to form from the top down and they're going to form these layers and those layers are called horizons okay so each of these horizontal colored layers over here each of these layers is called a soil horizon the horizons form because remember we're going to be washing all that stuff down from the top you're going to set up essentially the weathering front and that weathering front would be at least in this example right in here right the fresh rock is beneath it and the altered rock is above it cool so there's the altered rock there's the fresh rock and so my green line there would be essentially the weathering front now the different horizons that we can get in a soil have names and those names of those horizons have to do with the characteristics of those individual layers when we stack all of those individual layers right those horizons in a vertical sequence we call that a soil profile so on the left here this big stack over here of all these different colored layers is called a soil profile this is a very typical profile for soils in a temperate climate so something like what you would see on the Piedmont of North Carolina so near Raleigh or something like that okay now the horizons in a temperate region soil profile are going to have the following names okay they're going to have the O at the top you're going to have the A and then the E what's being shown over here this is actually an old terminology system let me do this this is the A and this is the E okay so this is O A E then as you keep going down you're going to get the B layer and then the C layer so let's look at each individual layer and how we can determine uh, what layer we're looking at okay at the topmost part of any soil horizon you will most often see the O horizon the O stands for organic okay so the organic horizon is an accumulation of humus humus is the dead and decaying plant material that is usually found right at the top of a soil so like this is really where you find the root mats okay where you're actually having the decaying plant material you might see leaves you might see uh, mushrooms and fungus and stuff up there but it's a very organic rich layer at least in temperate soils the O layer is relatively thin so you'll notice here it's relatively thin right it's not very thick and the other neat thing about how we can identify the O layer is it will be very dark colored so it'll be very dark brown to black and the reason for that is because it's so organic rich right the organics the carbon in the organics is what's giving the O layer it's very dark color 
As we move down into our next layer, okay, and remember we're going to change this to just, we'll call it just the A layer. The A layer is some humus, but it's also mixed with sediment, right, like sand, silt, or clay. If you notice over here, the A layer is quite a bit thicker in a temperate region soil, and it still has a, a beautiful kind of rich brown color, but it's slightly lighter than the O layer. So the A horizon, right, the A horizon here is going to have some organic material mixed in with some sediment material. Taken together, the O and the A layer are what we call topsoil. It's the organic rich stuff. So if you go to like Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever and you buy a bag of topsoil, what you're buying essentially is somebody's O and A layer and it's very organic rich, which is really important, right? That's usually why you wanna to buy topsoil is because it's got the organic nutrients in it that usually is used in your garden or for planting or whatever else. So let's keep moving down. Now that we've got the O and the A layers, we're going to move down into the E horizon. And again, I'm going to take out the A2 and I'm just going to make this the E horizon, right? Let's ignore that. That's an old system. So now we're in the E horizon. Notice over here on our soil profile, what's different about the color of the E horizon? Okay, it's beautiful, rich browns up here, right? What's different about this? What do you notice? The E layer usually has a much lighter color, and the reason for that is because it is very depleted. The um, E horizon, the E stands for alluviation. Alluviation is just a very fancy word for loss, okay? Alluviation is a word for loss or leaching. So this is the layer where all of the organic material, where all of the, well, not the organic material, where all of the um, mobile ions and all the clay and whatever else are being removed. They're being leached from here by all the water percolating through the system, right? Remember the water is all coming down this way. And so this is the zone of loss right here. And that's what gives it its very light color. So the zone of alluviation spelled with an E the E is where we get the E horizon name from. And just remember that this is a zone of loss. So if we're taking stuff from the E horizon and we're washing it down, right, with all of our water, where do you think it's all gonna go? If you said it's gonna go to the B horizon, the layer underneath it, then you're absolutely right. So all the stuff that's lost from here is now going to become accumulated in the B layer. So now we get a zone of accumulation or alluviation if you want, but a zone of accumulation here as new minerals are being deposited or precipitated and they're moving down from the zone of loss into this zone of alluviation, uh, uh, excuse me, alluviation or gain. So this is a zone of accumulation. Okay, or gain, cool. Now notice that the color here is slightly reddish. The reddish color in the B horizon comes from oxidized iron. And the oxidized iron is usually happening because there's lots of fluids collecting down there and the um, iron in the water is now being oxidized by, um, uh, by that loss of electrons, right? Like we talked about earlier. So iron oxide in, in the B layer usually gives it a reddish color. As we get further and further down now, we're kind of getting into what's called the C horizon. Now the C horizon is what we call weathered bedrock. Okay, so it's kind of degraded, broken down, weathered bedrock. It is, it is essentially um, kind of the, the next layer to become soil. And the C layer, the C layer here, shown over here, the sea layer is kind of this degraded area where the bedrock beneath it is starting to weather and break down into what will become the soil package. Beneath the sea layer is this R layer, and the R layer, of course, stands for rock, right, bedrock. So weathered bedrock is the sea layer. This is weathered bedrock is the sea layer. And fresh or unweathered bedrock is the R layer. Essentially, the weathering front would be right between the C and the R layers. So the weathering front would be right in here. 
when you see soils in the wild right when they're actually out in nature sometimes it's really really easy to see the different soil horizons for example do you notice how kind of right above my yellow line here this is the o horizon and it's a darker color than the layer beneath it this is the layer beneath it that I would consider the A layer. You still see organics, right? I still see roots in it, but it's a slightly lighter color brown. I would then say that this is probably the E layer here. Notice that it's a much lighter color, right? This is the zone of loss or zone of leaching. Just realized you can't read that. There you go, zone of loss here. Notice how the color changes down here now, right? How it's really, really red. So this would probably be then somewhere in here would be your zone of accumulation. So this would be your B layer. And then down at the bottom here, notice how the color goes back to kind of a different color from this reddish color. This would then be your C layer where you get altered bedrock. Now, the picture on the right is a little bit different. Now, see if you can figure out where is the O layer. I would probably pick the O layer somewhere in here. Okay, now what about an A layer? Well, I'd probably pick an A layer somewhere in there. So that would be my O layer and that would be my A layer. Now, do you see an E layer in this soil? <clears throat> Remember that the E layer is the zone of loss and it should be a much lighter color because it's been leached. I don't see an E layer in this soil at all, but I do see a B layer, a nice red layer, and I see that we're getting down here at the bottom, we're getting into a C layer. So this is to remind me to tell you that here, if these are our, our soil horizons, not every soil has to have every layer. Not every soil has to have every soil horizon present. A couple of different things are going to affect the type of soil and how thick the soil is. The one thing that, um, that is kind of very helpful is the substrate. The substrate is just what's the rock that's deteriorating to form the soil. If imagine, this is supposed to say under here limestone. I'm not sure why you can't see that, but that's supposed to say limestone. Limestone is much weaker than, for example, sandstone. So soil on top of a sandstone will be very thin, but soil that forms on a limestone is going to be very thick. OK, that's because limestone breaks down much easier than sandstone does. So the rock that is weathering dictates the thickness of the soil that you're going to get. You already know that climate is going to affect the um, soil formation, right? Because with um, heat and rainwater, right, that's going to speed up weathering and that's going to make a nice big thick soil package. Places where it's relatively arid um, and maybe with colder temperatures, you won't have as much weathering and therefore you won't have as big of a soil package. Slope steepness is really important for a place like Boone, right? So think about in places around Boone, do you have really thick soils? Whenever there's like a, you know, the, okay, Boone Creek as it cuts through campus, if you ever look at the banks of Boone Creek, are there really big thick soils there? Actually, there aren't. And the reason for that is because when you have really, really steep slopes, right, if you have steep slopes like this, any soil that forms on that is then going to usually landslide off. And so it will accumulate in areas of low slope. So when slopes are very steep, you usually get little to no soils accumulating. And so up in Boone, we don't have a whole lot of soil because every time a soil package is made, it then, um, it then landslides off and it accumulates further down the mountain. <clears throat> time is of course important as well because with time you get more weathering. So uh, older, uh, older exposed rock is gonna make a, a, a bigger or thicker soil, right? Because you've had a lot more time for weathering processes to happen. And last but not least, vegetation is also important. Um, around here, we have a lot of Christmas tree farms and Christmas trees are actually very, very hard on the soil. They take a lot of nutrients out of the soil. So the type of soil that you form under, say, Christmas trees versus the type of soil that you form under, say, grass or alfalfa is going to be um, very different, especially in its nutrient content. So the types of vegetation 
can affect the, um, the color, the nutrient content, the properties of the soil underneath it. So in different climate regimes, you can actually get very different types of soils. And there's, <laughs> there's literally almost a hundred different types of soils, and we won't go into all of them. I'm gonna give you instead the three main soil types that you see uh, around the world's climates. The first one that we'll talk about here is called a pedalfer. So a pedalfer is something that you would see in a temperate climate. So think of like, you know, maybe like Raleigh, North Carolina, something like that. You might see a pedalfer. A pedalfer is going to have uh, a pretty good O horizon, right? And a decent A horizon. You'll see humus. You're gonna see some iron and aluminum precipitated in the B layers. And it's usually going to be forming on granite bedrock. Okay, so an igneous, you know, felsic granite type bedrock. So you'll have a good O and an A layer and a pretty decent B layer. And then you'll get down to the granite bedrock. Our second type of soil here is called a pedocal. And the C-A-L part, the ped, by the way, P-E-D, ped means like pedogenic, that means soil formed. So a pedocal is a soil that is formed in an arid in environment. So this is a dry climate. So you might think of like um, Arizona. This is a good example of a pedocal. Think of it, is it gonna have a really thick O layer? Not really, because we don't have a whole lot of organics to add to the O layer. So it's gonna have very small to no organics. You will have a little bit of an A layer, okay? Probably not as big as you did in your pedalfer, so you'll have a thin A layer. And then instead of it having down here granite bedrock, we're gonna have usually a sedimentary rock bedrock that is either sandstone or limestone, which means that the B layer is gonna have a lot of CaCO3, that is calcite or limestone. So notice pedocal, the cal stands for calcite. You're gonna have a lot of calcite in the subsurface and that's gonna make it very, very hard. Okay, it's very, very resistant. So if you've heard of like caliche or um, desert pavement, that is all because of the calcium carbonate that is forming in the subsurface of these dry climate soils called pedicals. Our last one over here, I'm gonna make this guy red because laterites are forming in very wet climates. So think of the tropics, right? So, you know, something like, I don't know, Brazil or the Amazon or something like that would be where laterites are. Now, these are in the tropics where you have rainforests, right? So you have a lot of trees and vegetation, but because you have so much rainfall, you have almost no organic layer. And the reason for that is because so much rainfall coming down on top of that organics decomposes the organic material almost immediately. So you have a very thin or absent humus layer. What you would then instead have is because you have tons of rainfall falling on laterites, you get a huge thick zone of loss. So you have a very big E layer, okay, big zone of loss. And then what you do is you essentially take all that material that is able to be moved. The, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the E layer, okay, means that all of that soluble ions and all of those things have been removed. And then you get a thick left behind mass of insoluble iron and aluminum oxides. So FEOs, and aluminum oxides. These are really important because if you remember from your minerals lab, this is where we get bauxite. Bauxite is a huge economic mineral and we find it a lot forming in laterites. So many tropical region soils are um, being cut down, the trees are being cut down and the soils are being mined for these bauxites, mainly because everything else in that soil has been removed, but since aluminum is insoluble, the aluminum stays behind, and so there's these big bauxite deposits in the B layer of laterites, and that's what we're cutting down the rainforests for and trying to mine the bauxite mineral. <clears throat> 
So okay, so we've got a pedalfer in the pet in the temperate regions, pedicals in the dry regions, and our third one here was the laterite formed in the tropics. The interaction between humans and soils can be um, pretty tricky, uh, and I'm already kind of alluding to that with the sense that we are cutting down uh, rainforests in order to get at the lateritic soils underneath. This becomes a problem, uh, and we want to think about like the kind of um, environmental impact of humans using soils. Um, remember we said that lateritic soils are tropical soils, right? There's a lot of rainfall in that area, and so they are severely leached. <clears throat> they have, yes, the iron oxide and the aluminum oxide left behind, and that is something that you know, we do like to mine, but a lot of the other material, the nutrients and whatever else, the organics, have all been removed by the high rainfall. What that means is that it's very difficult to, um, once you take the native vegetation off of a lateritic soil, it is very difficult to put any sort of agriculture back on that soil because it is so nutrient depleted. A lot of times these tropical soils are found in less developed regions. They use what's called slash and burn agricultural which means that they will cut down and then burn the native vegetation. They will then mine the lateritic soil, and you'll see here they're actually using the lateritic soil for bricks. <clears throat> but the problem is, is that when you now have kind of the naked soil left over, there's too few nutrients left in it for any new plants to grow, so you get no new vegetation. And when the trees are gone, these lateritic soils are very clay rich and I don't, I don't know if you notice what happens when you add clay plus really high temperatures, you get bricks. Bricks are good for building, but once the actual uh, devegetated surface <clears throat> now sits out in the, in, the in the daily sun, the soil starts to bake, it becomes like a brick and it's almost impossible to uh, re-break it down to use it for anything like you know uh, planting or anything like that. It is extremely hard to cultivate once that natural soil has actually sat out in the sunshine and started to really kind of um, solidify. So yeah, we can use that baked soil for, for housing material for bricks, but I'm also using that term, it turns into a brick as more of a natural system thing too. Once that exposed soil surface has now kind of baked in the sun, it's really unusable for anything. You can't try to kind of cultivate it or anything like that. So it's a big challenge in tropical regions. One of the other things <clears throat> many environmental geologists actually have to deal with this is wetland soils. Um, wetlands are extremely important to uh, coastal regions, to the, the health of our waterways because wetlands, if you have kind of like, you know, imagine that you have a river and then you might have kind of a wetland around it, right? If this is our river flowing this way, the wetland that's around it, a lot of times is that when contaminants enter into the wetlands, the wetland is what filters out the contaminant before it gets into the waterway. So our wetlands act as retention ponds. They can help mitigate flooding, right? They can filter contaminants. These are really, really important features and so it is extremely crucial that we take care of our natural wetlands. They're rich in organics, and that's also really important too. They're nurseries for lots of different types of organisms. However, because they are around areas that have uh, surface water, rivers, oceans, whatever else, um, when humans interact with wetland soils, we often drain those wetland soils in order to provide either agricultural lands, right, because they're rich in organics, or for building. If you can think of, um, my parents used to live down by the Neuse River in New Bern, and tons of wetlands there along the Trent and the Neuse River were being drained so that they could now fill them in and make waterfront communities. <clears throat> Thankfully, the Clean Water Act kind of protects wetlands right now, but there has been a lot of damage done to wetland soils prior to the Clean Water Act uh, to where we've drained those very helpful and very healthy wetlands 
to now uh, create either agricultural land or places where we can build housing communities. If you look at a, a diagram like this, after I get all my little check marks out of the way, each of the little red dots here shows you about 20,000 acres of wetlands that had been drained um, prior to 1990 so that they could create agricultural area. And one thing you'll notice, much of it sits right here, right? In this zone right here. What comes right down this main zone here? Yep, that's the Mississippi River Valley. So all the wetlands, right, that are on the edges of the Mississippi River were drained so that they could create uh, agricultural regions. Um, Florida has a ton of wetlands. Um, North and South Carolina have a ton of coastal wetlands. And a lot of those, of course, have been drained to make agricultural areas. The um, process of weathering, of course, now makes our sediment and makes our soil. Um, but of course, that sediment and that soil doesn't stay put. A lot of times it can get detached and transported and moved from its original formation location. Um, sometimes that can be a, a very natural process. For, for example, if you notice uh, this right here, this is the coast of Africa. And so over here, this would be the Sahara Desert. And so winds blowing off the Sahara, you'll notice this is a huge plume right here of Sahara Desert sand. And so just normal winds coming off the Sahara can actually send sand grains from the Sahara Desert all the way over into the Gulf of Mexico. So movement of, of sediment, which is what we call erosion, that's a very natural process. But a lot of times, because of the way that humans interact with sediment and soil, we can kind of exacerbate this to a point that it becomes hazardous. There can be natural processes, of course, by wind and water, that's what we were just talking about, that can move or erode sediment. But human activities of overcropping, overgrazing, and deforestation are causing unnatural erosion to become a very big problem around the world. Here's, an, here's a, just a little cartoon, right, that this is, a, this is not a political statement, but essentially the idea of over farming, right? If we over farm an area, if we take up all the kind of natural vegetation or even our cultivated uh, vegetation, here we're growing corn, what tends to happen is that too much farming strips all the nutrients and the natural ability of the soil to maintain vegetation that what we leave behind, unfortunately, is a very barren, um, uh, soil that is unable to grow any type of vegetation anymore. So over farming is actually a pretty critical thing that's going on in the central part of the U.S. right now. Here's another example, but this is instead of over farming, this is over grazing. Okay, this is a fence post. This is a fence line right in here. Cattle were allowed to graze over here and then no cattle access over here. Notice that there's plenty of natural vegetation over here but the cattle have completely stripped the natural vegetation on the left side here of this fence line. So um, overgrazing is a really important impact um, of uh, human interaction with soil. So the soil over here, right, has very little to no organic content anymore because the cattle have actually um, pulled it up. Um, goats and horses are actually even more detrimental than cattle because um, they actually will pull up grass by the roots and goats will eat everything, not, not just grass. They'll eat trees, bushes, shrubs, license plates, you name it. So um, depending on where you are in the world and the type of uh, livestock that you're keeping, it can be extremely harsh on the soil underneath. Between 1990 and 2015, the world lost 150 million hectares of forest. So that's equal to the size of the South African country. So this brings us into this idea of um, deforestation. And I love this image because it's supposed to be showing you that, you know, forests, of course, are the lungs, right, of the planet, but that we're actually then taking a huge part of the uh, Earth's breathing system, the, um, the forests, we're cutting down those forests due to deforestation. So um, part of that is due to um, mining of lateritic soils. Part of it is also just due to the need for, uh, you know, tropical hardwoods or whatever else. But it's really damaging because, of course, the oxygen produced 
by um, the world's forests is, is significant. And so we're reducing the forests, of course, and that's causing major problems, not only for our atmosphere, but also for the soil. So over farming, over grazing and deforestation lead to soil erosion. So this is kind of unnatural soil erosion. When we take off deep rooted vegetation like trees and we replace them with crops that have very shallow roots like grasses or you know, alfalfa or soybeans or whatever, we, um, we end up creating serious problems with erosion. You can imagine if you had a soil, right? And don't laugh at my drawing, but here's a tree. And let's imagine that the tree has really deep, thick roots, right? Those roots are gonna actually work to hold that soil in place. If we cut down the tree, and now we have a soil that just has grass or some sort of a thin crop on it, and the roots are really thin, we're not holding a whole lot of that soil in place. And so when uh, water rushes in, what you tend to see is massive movement of that sediment. The roots can't hold it in place and you get um, flash flooding, washouts, and huge divots like this. When we clear the land of native vegetation, we can also increase soil erosion. Um, I'm not sure, when I was in school, we had to read The Grapes of Wrath um, by Ernest Hemingway. That was one of the books we had to read in high school English class. And um, that was all about the Dust Bowl, right, in the 1930s. Um, and if you want to, if you click on the Dust Bowl right here, it'll show you a, a short video about what happened to the U.S. in the 1930s. There was a huge boom of agriculture in the central part of the United States, Texas, the Dakotas, Oklahoma, and whatever else. And so they were clearing the native vegetation. We were removing all the native vegetation and replacing it with crops, thin um, crops and shallow rooted crops. Well, in the mid 1900s, there was a huge drought. And so a lot of the crops died. So now you have no vegetation holding the soil in the central part of the US uh, to the surface. And along with that drought, you had extremely high winds. So you can actually see what happened is we created what's called the Dust Bowl. Um, no vegetation was holding the soil in place. The drought and the high winds meant that there were enormous dust storms. If you look at the picture over here on the right, you'll notice that like here's the top of wagon wheels. So the wagon has literally been buried by almost a meter's worth of sediment. This is a vehicle in the back. Again, a meter's worth of sediment because all the dust has been blown around um, and essentially nothing could grow and there was a huge famine associated with this during the Dust Bowl. So during this process of kind of unnatural soil erosion, usually what we lose is the O and the A horizons. Now, why is that important? Remember, the O and the A horizons are what we call the topsoil. So the, the layers or the horizons that are lost are the ones that are mostly organic rich. And the organic rich stuff is what has all the nutrients in it. So if we remove or lose the O and the A horizons, it is very difficult to replace the nutrients that used to be in those layers. So we kind of take the O, A, E, B, C, if we kind of erode off and remove all of that, what's the next layer that's exposed at the surface? It's the E layer, and that's a zone of loss. So it's a very nutrient poor layer that is now exposed at the surface, which means it's very difficult to revegetate. Uh, on top of this, when we uh, erode soil, the soil that we are now eroding, right, the O plus the A layer, often contains contaminants in it like pesticides and herbicides, things that we used to put on the O and the A layers to help our plants grow. Now, as we remove that topsoil that has all those contaminants in it, uh, we can wash it away and of course then contaminate our local waterways. You may not think of it, but the actual sediment itself can actually become its own pollutant. So even if there's no um, pesticide or herbicide in the topsoil that's being eroded, just by flooding surface water, like a river or a pond or a stream or something like that, with a ton of sediment, 
that can be a major problem. You can imagine that fish who like to live in a nice clear pond, if you flush that pond with a ton of suspended sediment, the fish are actually going to get choked and they won't be able to, um, to live. And so it is just the sediment itself that can actually become a pollutant and can either um, contaminate the local waterways or like in the example of the dust bowl, you can smother other crops to where they are able, they're not able to live because they've now been buried by, you know, a thick package of um, redeposited sediment. If we also think too uh, of soil, yeah, soil is formed naturally, of course, but soil forms very, very slowly. How long do you think it takes to make one inch of soil? And I usually have this covered and I'm not sure why I just asked you that question even though the answer is right here. But look at this, it takes 500 to 1000 years to make one inch, one inch of soil, okay? So one inch of soil can take up to 1000 years to form that. But one good storm, right, or one drought or one major tornado or something like that can just uh, erode an inch of soil overnight. So how long does it take to lose an inch of soil? If you think of it not as a catastrophic event, right, not as a tornado or a hurricane or something like that, but just at current rates of natural erosion, it can take 50 years to remove or lose one inch of soil. So notice the, the problem that we have here. It can take up to a thousand years to form one inch and we can lose one inch in just 50 years. So while soil is a, a natural formed resource, we are removing it much, much faster than we can form it. And so it's almost becoming a non-renewable resource. Not all hope is lost though, right? It is important to remember that there are things that we can do to try to keep soil from eroding. And this will um, help uh, our, the, keep the soil in place, help keep the soil um, nutrient rich. Um, and so uh, farmers are actually doing a lot of this across the US and elsewhere in order to kind of you know, reduce soil erosion and help keep our soils healthy. One thing that's important is to keep the ground planted. Remember, we said that the roots are going to help to keep the soil in place. If there's vegetation there, the roots are gonna keep the soil from being washed away as much as possible. And so keeping the ground planted year round or every season is certainly going to be helpful. You can do something called contour plowing, right? Or terracing. That's what's shown in the picture below here, right? You can actually have, instead of straight line hedges, you can have kind of contoured or curved rows of vegetation. You can actually work with the natural uh, contour of the land so that you don't just have uh, straight lined crops that are uh, creating uh, ridges and valleys that help channel water straight down, say a slope or whatever else. Contour plowing is actually really important and terracing, especially in places like you know Mexico and South America, where they're able to farm on steeper slopes but they use this contour plowing or terracing to help keep the slope stable so that we don't see vegetation actually kind of uh, sliding down on those slopes. You can also use windbreaks, right? You can actually create, uh, you can build hedgerows, right? Imagine that if, we, if you lived in a really windy area and you have a farm in a very windy area, you can build hedges, right? All around your cropland like this, which reduces the amount of wind that makes it onto your crops and therefore reduces the amount of wind that is trying to blow away your sediment. And you can also do something called strip cropping. This means that you're gonna plant different crops in subsequent rows, right, in different strips, so that you try to minimize the amount of soil erosion. So certain crops are very hard on the soil, other crops aren't. And so if you plant something like, you know, hay, which is grass here, oats, which are here, and corn, which is here, you're not putting all corn, which is very hard on the ground and hard on the soil, you're not putting all corn in the same area. You're putting um, 
oats and hay in uh, the same region so that parts of your fields can actually kind of uh, recuperate, regain a little bit of the nutrients, but also too, they're lower to the ground and they are able to hold some of the soil in place and that minimizes soil erosion. Soil degradation is a big problem throughout the world. And you'll see that here, if soil degradation is a change in soil health, so much so that it diminishes the, the capacity of the soil to provide the goods and services that uh, people around the world might need. This is a map here showing soil degradation, and I've added it to say human-induced soil degradation. And of course, you can see the places that have the red color are places where the human activity, whether it be agriculture or deforestation, overgrazing or overcropping, have seriously started to deteriorate the soils, so much so that the soil now has a diminished capacity to grow the foods or to provide the services that the local populations need. <clears throat> You'll also notice too that these are places that are heavily populated. Notice it's India, Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Central America, and of course, the what we would call the breadbasket of North America, which is the central part there, the upper Midwest and the Mississippi River Valley. So um, lots of different types of soil degradation uh, occur. Um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, things like overgrazing, deforestation, and agricultural activity. But there is uh, a small amount, too, of uh, overuse of vegetation, for example, by uh, cutting down trees to create uh, firewood, and a little bit by industrial activity. And the under, so these are the underlying causes, right? This is the human induced reasons for why we are creating soil degradation. <clears throat> and then what actually happens is that then the soil is removed by water and by wind, chemical degradation, as well as physical degradation. So it's important to remember that soil erosion is caused when we have kind of poor land management, climate change, and excessive cropping. We do have potential solutions, right? We have um, uh, ways that we can uh, mitigate, right, soil erosion. We can use certain techniques like we mentioned with um, uh, planting windbreaks or doing strip cropping or whatever else so that we're trying as hard as we can to kind of keep the topsoil, that nutrient-rich, organic-rich topsoil in place uh, and, uh, and reduce um, soil erosion as much as possible. So, okay, so we'll stop here. And um, if you finished all of today's lecture um, uh, up to this point, then you are actually uh, in great shape because that means you don't have to do any sort of class material for tomorrow. So this is the end of the material for next Monday's quiz. So if you got through all of the stuff today, you are in good shape and you don't have to have class tomorrow. So we will have lab, but uh, you don't have to do class. So um, we will finish our uh, Thursday lab tomorrow, but if you finish this on your Wednesday assignment, then you are good to go, and I will see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock for lab.